Oslo. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the uh, Aris MTV uh, current status and what's going on, and also about the merger facility that uh, we've been working on for a while now. Um, so I'm going to run through uh, a quick overview of MTV, um, how it's been used in contacts for some of you who may not have seen it about it before, uh, what its current status is, which is um, quite interesting at the moment, and then um, some of the reasons why we developed this uh, TS merger facility and how it's used. Um, so for those of you who um, don't know about MTV, this is a transmitter on the International Space Station. Um, there was a proposal put together about 2000-2001 and in uh, 2008 when ESA launched their Columbus Science Lab, uh, there were a couple of patch antennas mounted to the outside. Um, in 2013, then the transmitter, which you can see on the uh, slide here, um, was up mass and commissioned. Um, so it's NTSC composite and audio input, so it takes a feed straight from the cameras that they have on the space station, and then it outputs uh, DPS, um, two mode symbols, uh, 2395 with about 10 watts ERP, uh, with MP2 video, MP2 audio, uh, quite a lot of null panning in there as well due to certain reasons. Um, but this all goes into the antenna on Columbus, which would be nice if it was on the bottom of the space station. Uh, it isn't actually, it's sort of slightly off centre and looking slightly backward most of the time, which creates its own challenges. So, normally uh, we have the transmitter on whenever we can. Um, occasionally it's turned off uh, for EVAs, um, spacewalks, or when they're docking, um, docking craft to the space station, it's turned off for safety reasons. Um, and also we do share a pass pipe, another experiment that gets used occasionally. So at that point, pass pipe gets disconnected, whatever. But other than that, the transmitter is running, mm -hmm. however, there's no camera plugged in. So we get a black screen with a blue line on the left, nobody really knows why there's a blue line. Uh, and then you've got audio system hiss in the background, it gives people something to tune up on. But when we do these ARIS contacts, so these are school contacts where they have a um, one pass the ISS, so about 10 minutes horizon to horizon, to ask the uh, astronaut questions. These are normally done over VHF, FM, radio. Um, but this has been designed as a supplement to that, so as well as getting the voice feed, they also have live video of the astronaut. Um, so you can see here, these are a couple of pictures from uh, Tim Peake's um, mission from Kipia that we did. Um, and you can see at the bottom, we've got uh, the live picture up there with the kids, and you can see the kids looking at the, at the picture as well. So they're being able to watch the astronaut as they talk to them, and it makes it feel like they're not so much hidden in a black box on the desk, but this is actually someone that they're talking to who is up there on the space station. Also means uh, they can say give us a wave, or they can show a demonstration live as well. Um, so this, this has been used for quite a few contacts. Um, we first used it uh, successfully in uh, the Procopia mission with Tim Peake, and since then, uh, Paolo Nespoli, um, Thomas Pesquet, uh, and Jack Fisher, um, and maybe one or two others have also used it as part of their contacts, so the astronaut can elect to use it. Some of them don't like it because it's live, uh, they're engineers and pilots, they're not really um, TV presenters, but. Uh, Quite a few of them enjoy it. Um, unfortunately, recently we tried using this for a contact in the UK uh, in August, and the VHF radio that's in the Columbus module, so alongside the transmitter, uh, failed um, in that they couldn't hear us, we couldn't hear them. Uh, we actually tried to use the MTD audio as the downlink, however, there's a six second delay in the encoder on the ISS makes voice a little bit um, difficult, especially when something's already gone wrong in contact and everyone's a little nervous and impatient. Uh, so this unfortunately just failed. Uh, we fell back to using the VHF radio in the Russian service module, which is at the other end of the space station, does knowing a TV transmitter. Um, in 
for a pair of vans or replacements of that rather, uh, a Kenwood D710 uh, is currently undergoing certification to be up mass before the end of this year, so to be putting the on us, replace the old Ericsson VHF radio that's in there, and we're excited to have to be again. However, um, back in April, so um, after I was first asked to do this talk, uh, we stopped hearing transmissions from Ham TV. Um, about the 6th of April was the last transmission heard. Uh, since then, people have watched on spectrum analyzers on all possible frequencies. We've had the astronaut going to turn, turn it off, turn it on again, uh, and nothing's been heard. So today, after much um, work by ARIS to try and get time to off astronaut time, at 1725 UTC today, one of the astronauts is going to fully deconfigure the uh, transmitter, unplug the cables, plug a different S band antenna in, and then reconfigure it all the way up again. Um, so that then ground stations this evening and tomorrow can listen in, try and find out um, if there's any life coming from the transmitter. So everyone's got fingers crossed about this. Um, this there is a uh, web page where you can watch the uh, for any output this evening. I'll be covering with exactly what's on that later. Um, if if this doesn't work, the current plan is that uh, the transmitter will be brought down um, in one of the vehicles that comes down um, and then repaired on the ground where we can actually get to it. And then if there's no major hardware modifications, they should be able to launch it again without certification, which will be ideal as that's a process that takes many months. Um, and that would hopefully get it up within, again, within a few months, should we answer a parable. Um, so that, that's part of the status. We don't really know what's going on with it. There's a few ideas going around. Maybe it's the DA, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. But if today doesn't work, then it's going to be when we get down on the ground, someone can actually put it with a bit of test gear. Because uh, trying to schedule that and all the time, and then trying, and then, of course, they don't have much test gear available to work there. Uh, it's difficult. Um, so, to, to move on with how we've been using this, uh, one of the challenges we had was, um, especially with the technique missions, we were turning up to these schools one or two days in advance, um, setting up the VHF radio side of things, we're tracking and everything, but also trying to set up an S band dish as well, uh, as I was on the back of the Nose Land Rover, and getting the full station set up, um, calibrated, um, check for sun tracking and everything in two days, and getting the display set up in the school, getting up all that set up, can be quite a lot of pressure. Um, also, you turn up and there's a massive building in the way that's going to um, obscure some of your parts. So, we at the time we got uh, systems from um, satellite applications, Catapult, the Google Middle Earth Station to have a feed from one of their dishes down there that we could rely on as a backup feed to switch to if there was any issue or if that was dropped out, and we used that successfully. However, uh, this, this was one backup station. It didn't really work rather well because it was a 3 meter dish, 3.6 meter dish. Um, but that's not available all the time. So we also had, um, so we looked into getting other stations involved, and um, the first attempt at that was this, which is basically a live stream from each station, and then there'd be someone sitting there, and whenever one dropped out, close that full screen, go to the next one that's working, and full screen that. Um, which sort of works, but it's a bit clunky, requires someone sitting there, isn't really the best we can do. Um, so we've got these stations spaced out geographically, and we just wanted to combine everything into one feed that could go into the school, and no matter what goes on with the local receiver, whether we've got interference, so we had, we had some problems on the team the missions with uh, misbehaving access points, wiping out any reception on that. Also, when they've got all the spacecraft docked on the bottom of the ISS, they actually get in the way of the antenna, uh, at which point you can't move around that on the ground. So we wanted to provide one feed that used all these ground stations dotted across Europe, um, and hopefully to be used in other regions as well, um, to provide that one feed that will give the school eight minutes of video that they can watch without it stuttering and varying blocks and such. So we started to look at um, what's actually in the signal. And um, so of course it's DPS, it's MPTS, and so it's the transport stream is packed into these 188 byte packets, each of which has a PID. 
So you see the video, audio, um, other metadata, <coughs> null padding. So we have these, all these data, bits of data coming in, and it'd be great if we could just grab holes, fill holes in one with data from another, basically. So these, these packets, the FEC is checked. Um, so we've been using to tune software, seeing as it's the only thing that can receive ISS at the moment. Um, it checks the FEC and will just not upload a packet if uh, the CLC doesn't match. So we end up with these streams that look a bit like this, where we're missing blocks from certain stations. However, actually lining up which blocks are which is difficult. We'd like to be able to do a sort of um, compare the binary of each, but then if we get incomplete segments, we don't actually know which packets came first or such. Um, so there is a PCR clock, uh, program clock reference timestamp, which is on tagged onto uh, some of the video in, in Ham TV. And this is about every one in 50 packets that we have. And that is incrementing, so it's based on the 27 megahertz clock, it's valid on the 27 megahertz clock, rolls over about once every 31 days, so that's not an issue. And we use that to synchronize, so we line everyone up at PCRs, at PCR timestamp value. So we end up with what you can see here, uh, coming in from multiple stations, and we run 100 milliseconds of buffer, so we buffer 100 milliseconds um, from uh, basically from the last output. And that allows a bit of uh, relative delay. We had uh, some fun with Goon Hilly, has a very nice internet connection, has an upload, about, upload delay of about five milliseconds. Then we had uh, Jean Pierre and um, Fabrice and others in France with 4G connections. They had 60 milliseconds of upload latency. So they're, they're all quite mismatched. This 100 milliseconds is a buffer, but as long as people fit in, it works. And it's a relative 100 milliseconds. So we have had success with stations in the stream that we're using it because they all come in at plus about 150 milliseconds, but then the variance between them is less than 100 milliseconds. So it's fine. It still works. So once we've got the, the data from the stations, um, basically we start at the PCR and then we look for packets until the next PCR turns up and the, we pick the most complete path. So you can see here. Occasionally we don't get enough data, which you can see on the right, and which point it will make a jump to the next PCR, and that will come through as a discontinuity in the video. Even though ideally we have the packets you can see there to fill the gap, but we don't have timestamps to line it up. Um, but in fact, with a few good stations on there, that happens very rarely. So this then goes as it builds up a complete path, it then copies that into the output buffer and that becomes the output stream. So each, each station is, there's a prime station that's selected for each segment about 50 times a second. So that's the core of it. And what we've done to interface it is um, from tune, we've got the UDB TS output. So um, we listen to that, which gives us the raw transport stream. And we have a little application that listens to that, filters out the um, null padding packets, so we get rid of, uh, we only have the video and the audio coming through. It then uploads that, and um, we had a few issues with this, where we started off uploading each of these 188 byte packets in an individual UDP packet. And um, about half of people claim uh, stated to that, I saw it as well, click the go button and the reader crashes. Um, turns out throwing lots of UDP packets it like that, it doesn't like it. So it now gets packed, packed into, I think, four packets per UDP packet, which works out well. Um, this then goes up to the server, so that's, the UDP goes up to the server and gets put into these input buffers that you can then use to select from. Uh, we chose UDP because by the time that you've re-requested data, like you would with GCP, um, at that point, your, your end-to-end latency will usually be over the millisecond buffer anyway, so the data is not useful at that point. Um, so this then goes into an output, and it uses TCP for the output mainly because this was more easily interfaceable. Um, and also at that point, it's on wider internet. It's not trying to go over people's 4G connections that will drop packets and such. It tends to be not need any um, read transmission basically. Um, so we have the UDP from Minishu on the ground stations. Um, that being uploaded, go 
equivalent of the call coming out to TCP. And then what we've done is we've set up this page, and I've got a screenshot of here, um, which has a HTML5 live viewer. So there's actually a process behind that then turns out into HTML5 video that people can watch. Um, and also on the right of it, you can see here that there's uh, all the ground stations listed with what's their current uh, elevation of the ISS, is, roughly when you'd expect them to get signal, and also whether we're currently receiving data from them and whether they've been chosen as a prime receiver. And you quite, as I mentioned before, they're chosen at 50 times a second, so quite often them, we highlight several stations rather than trying to switch this display at 50 times a second. I believe this update's at 10 times a second, um, or thereabouts. Um, so that gives people a live view of how well it's working and who's being, which receivers being selected. Uh, again, we've had um, a few people being a bit unhappy that if Goon Gilly's online, Goon Gilly is always selected. Because Goon Gilly tends to upload quickest with the lower latency, therefore it always fills slot zero when the program goes through. And seeing as it nearly always has the most complete, it will not nearly always be picked as prime receiver if there's a feed coming from it. It's not to say that the data is higher quality because it's digital, so if it's past CLC, then the video data is exactly the same as everybody else's. It just happens that due to the behavior, if Google is uploading, it tends to get picked. If you bought the better internet connection than we do it, then they get picked instead. But it's these latencies that matches there, it's not the speed. Um, so we have been using this in contact, um, and this was contact, this was actually a telebridge done um, in Johnson Space Centre in the US, but the contact, it was a telebridge to uh, Europe, I forget, it was, I think it was uh, Claudio in Italy ran the telebridge for this one. Um, so he was doing the VHF and then it's piped over the internet to the Space Centre in Houston so that they could do it at a reasonable time of day when the orbits didn't line up with a reasonable time of day. Um, and so we had all the European ground stations and you can see on the on the right here on the status, the blue is the stations that are receiving we're receiving data and currently it's picked three stations as prime. So we've got Good Billy myself in Southampton, and then Wouter in Delft in the Netherlands, um, the ground station there. Um, so this has been used both as a backup for the station on site, but also for this one, of course, it's used as the primary feed into the, um, into the venue or school. And we have, so the, the HTML5, one of the things I mentioned about that is we often get, during the popular contacts, we get about five to 600 people watching it which is why it's HTML5, because that's easy to scale and we can deal with the demand. There is a bit of a delay on it because of how HTML5 works. Um, subsequently, the status, because that's near real time, um, it's about 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds behind, that updates before the video, uh, which can look a bit strange at times. We have got, so we've got that TCP feed, we, we make that available to the venue such that they can connect VLC or actually we've been working, um, we've used successfully a couple of times now actually, uh, a Raju Pi solution which connects straight to the TCD socket and decodes the MP2 and hardware on the Raju Pi. Um, that is from, I observed from Tichoum running on my receiver to me watching the Raju Pi, about 200 milliseconds going through the server getting merged with the other ground stations and then coming back down and actually being displayed on the line. That was 200 milliseconds, which um, is nice because it doesn't have any extra delay. Of course, we've still got a six second delay in the space segment, um, but we just have to deal with that. But the, what, this is about not having much extra delay. So the public view does have a bit more extra delay. Uh, this is the page where you can watch, uh, see if you can see if any ground stations pick it up, because the ground stations in Europe will be doing the checking if the ISIS receiver uh, transmitter works this evening will be connected up to this and this link has been publicised um, this is a live for Aristotle it's been publicised for um, people to watch and see if we receive anything and then hopefully we can get back to doing these kind of contacts um, so any questions on that? Yes. Yes. Um, if, if the transmitter has to be repaired, yep. 
is a, a chance to get a test pattern viewed it instead of a black picture. So the question was the question was if the if the transmitter gets repaired uh, or replaced, is there is there a possibility of getting a uh, test pattern included? That would be very good. Um, however, the there is hesitation on how much we can modify without requiring recertification. And I I don't know much about the specifics of it, but I really think that might require extra hardware. You know, even if it's just a little test line generator chip, at that point we've added new hardware to it, it's got to be recertified. And if they repair it thinking that it's okay and then turn around to NASA and NASA goes, you bought a bat that on it needs recertifying. That's tens of thousands of dollars in fees and time to get it sorted out. So they are being very cautious, so I don't think there's much chance of that, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. The software issue with the PID, which are missing? Uh, that, that is on the list of, that's very high on the list of changes they are considering, yes. Because, um, so uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, uh, for those of you that don't know, the HamTV is missing the program um, program map table and program so it's the program association table, which is PID zero, and tells the receiver what programs are available and points to program map tables that then tell them which PID um, the audio and video and any associated metadata is on. So we've got PID two five six for video and two five seven for audio. I think HamTV, um, but that program table was removed during development. Um, in an effort to debrand the transmission. They tested it with a set-top box that was there at the time, and it worked. However, they haven't turned off the set-top box. And it turns out that it caches the PMT, or PAT, we don't know which one's the issue. Um, and therefore, no receiver, can, no set-top box can currently receive it. Um, so this is why we have to use to tune. So yes, that is very high on the fix because being able to just receive it with a set-top box rather than requiring yeah. the mini tuner PCB would be very nice. Any other questions? Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Um, just quickly to mention, uh, this, this merger software is um, has been developed with uh, the assistance of the BHC. So the BHC hosted it um, for during much of its development. And Phil Heron um, actually built the main um, intricate core of it, um, and then I've been working on the interfacing and such around, around the edge, and all our work is on the Aris UK GitHub. If anybody wants to take a look. Uh, just a last question do you, do you know how long the MTB system will continue to work? <laughs> how long is it fair for um, the years? Because uh, it's almost 10 years. Uh, if it gets repaired, how much longer do we think? If it gets repaired, how much longer will the ham TV system last? We don't know. Um, there, there's also questions as to the future of the ISS, uh, so the future of the International Space Station, and how long it's going to continue to be supported. Um, I think the current feeling is that there, we're not expecting an issue before that potentially becomes an issue. Um, I don't think there's any expected uh, end to its life at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Phil, for that. That's a really good explanation. I'll just set myself up for the contest presentation.
in that there's loads of trees, but to the north it's a fantastic site, which is why I'm conditioned to point in that way. Okay, uh, I'm going to speak about the uh, contest, which I think is the highlight of the ATV operating year, and encourage you all and everybody watching on the stream to get on the air next week. The contest starts at 12 o'clock UTC on Saturday, runs all the way through till 6 o'clock in the evening UTC on Sunday. So there's 30 hours of contesting time. Now, clearly there are some enthusiasts who make the most of that, um, but there are also people who will just go out for one contact or just turn their gear on on Sunday. And we really want everybody to, to put in an entry. Don't feel that just because you've only had one contact, there's no point in you putting in an entry. This is about showing that we use the bands and encouraging other people to use the bags. So how do you do it? How many people here have participated in ATV contests before? We have one, two, three, four. Five. Good. Okay. Um, the basics of it is to get a four-figure code across by video. That's all that matters, getting that four-figure code across. Reports and locators can then be sent by other means. Now reports, how do you report on a TV signal? Well, there's the zero to five code. So say I worked uh, Noel, he was my first contact on the 23 Sainz band. I would give him a report of probably P5, because that's an easy band for us. Um, which means a perfect picture, 001. And I would probably tell him the, the, the sum of the four digits that he'd uh, just shown me. I'm not allowed to mention the four digits on the air, but I would say your four digits add up to 17 as a sort of cross-check that I haven't written it down wrong or seen it wrong. It's 15, actually. No, that's mine, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you then, having done that both ways, claim points per kilometre for each, for each direction. Uh, the points vary from band to band, and that's defined in the rules. All bands, 432 megahertz and up, are, in, are valid for the IARU contest. I know there's somebody in the room who's going to be trying for a 76 gig contact. I'm not sure anybody can beat that. Um, additionally, in the UK, we're going to run a contest, same rules, same times, covering 146 mix. Because most people will have a 144, 146 meg area with them for talkback anyway. So we're going to run a uh, UK contest on 146 as well. Talkback is usually on 144.75 FM in the UK. Do you know what other countries tend to use? Anybody in the room? Germany, 144, 750. 750 again in Germany, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The only sort of difficult bit in the rules is what happens about roving. This, now this is an American contest term that's snuck in to our uh, contest rules here. Um, stations are encouraged to go to a couple of places to work more people. So for example on the Saturday I'm going to go to a site on the south coast and then on the Sunday I'll go to the site we saw in the picture. You just have to move over five kilometres and then you effectively start a new entry. So you reset your serial numbers to, zero, to, to one for your first contact. You change all your codes so you have another set of codes so that people who worked you the previous day don't know your new codes. Uh, when you work at a station, you ask him to send him a second code because of course you know what code he was using from your last location. And you do a separate log 
But when the logs get together with your, your national adjudicator, he will add the two scores together. Now, some may say that's unfair because you get two entries. Well, actually, you're time limited on what, what you can do. You've only got this 30 hours. If you can drive between a number of sites in those 30 hours and put in multiple entries, great. It's more ATV activity. It's more, it's more contacts for other people. That's what the contest is about. So uh, that's the way it works. Right, for logging, there's quite a lot of information you're going to want to log here. And the Dutch have uh, done a very good Excel spreadsheet, which you can down, download. Um, and uh, hopefully your national society will have a link to that download. Um, fill in the Excel spreadsheet and send it off to your national coordinator. And that needs to be in by the third Monday after the contest. Your national coordinator will do your national story, and then he'll pass all the logs to the international coordinator, who for this year is me. Um, a non-changing email address has been set up, which is atv at iaru-r1.org. So every year, every country's logs should go to that address. If there is anybody on the stream or here who doesn't have a national coordinator, they can send logs directly to that address and they'll go into the international competition. The fun words and the fun words of the afternoon. The contest needs to be fun. We're not in it for 59 Zero zero one in your Oscar seven zero Charlie Charlie seventy three. Good luck in the contest. It's getting pictures of across there and playing around. It provides that proof of use of our bands, and that's very important to us. And don't forget, just put in an entry, even if you've only had one contact, and even if it's only with the guy in the next street. Doesn't matter. Put in an entry. Has anybody got any questions on the contest? Yeah. Uh, signal direction connection um, um, counting to when I've got a transmitter and you've got a receiver. You only get half the points for one way. The transmitting station should put the entry in, yes? And the transmitting station can put the entry in. The receiving station can also put the entry in and then take the points. If he is receive only. If you are only receiving, you can submit an entry for the stations you have received. If you are transmitting and receiving, you can't claim any points for one way where they didn't see you. <laughs> any other questions? Okay. No. How did you get to Italy after 71 Charlie Charlie? It's in the middle of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it was late at night last night. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, that concludes my presentation. Do you want to wind things up, Mark? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, well, um, ho hopefully you found the uh, session useful. We're, we're always interested in uh, trying to know what we should be presenting to you um, and ideas. Um, I think we've, we've tried to make time for people to talk as well and see the demonstrations and hopefully there's been some interesting topics there. Uh, I think the big topic of the year is going to be the satellite, the Sat. that's going to be big news for amateur radio for, uh, for a while. Um, but uh, it really is important that we are seen to be active, not only active, but also seem to be active on the bands, otherwise we are in danger of, of losing losing more spectrum. So um, help us you know, by telling us what you'd like to see in this session in future years and, um, and uh, you know, get on the air next weekend and if uh, we're, we're downstairs, there's the AGAF stand downstairs, we're next door to AGAF, so uh, come in and see us all and uh, 
have a, have a great uh, ham radio. Thank you very much. And we've got, we've got about half, about 20 minutes, I think, before we need to. Yes. And we Officially, after four, after four o'clock. Yeah, but, but he, he, after Yeah, so they'd like to come in early. So, yeah. We'll try and make them so we recorded the second session. So. Oh. Which one